St. Paul tells the Corinthians in our second reading today, consider the call you have received. Consider the call you have received. It was announced a couple of months ago that the next meeting of Pope Francis and the bishops, which is called a synod, uh, will be taking place in about a year and a half, and that that synod will be on youth and young adults. So the whole world will be talking about all the bishops and all the theologians, and in fact, everyone, just like the last synod on the marriage and the family, where everyone was surveyed, uh, had an opportunity around the world to offer feedback. Uh, again, that sort of preparation will be taking place uh, to get ready for that meeting looking at youth and young adults. And it's particularly coming from uh, the perspective of vocation and the idea of young people and helping them respond, hear and respond to the call that God is giving to them. And so about two weeks ago, the Vatican released a document that was just sort of a preparatory document, kind of setting the stage, a preamble or something along those lines to get ready for this whole, all of this preparation that will be taking place. It's actually fairly short by Vatican standards. It was only about 20 pages. And so I had the opportunity this past couple of weeks to take it in and to read through the letter. And it was very beautiful and had a lot of great things uh, to meditate on, to pray about. And it resonated with my experience as over the last 15 years as a teacher uh, and high school coach and, and priest and chaplain and that sort of thing, working with young adults. Uh, over the last 15 years. And so I wanted to just offer a couple of things. First of all, uh, a couple of general observations. First of all, it, it talked about the idea that vocation, vocation discernment is struggling overall. So if we think about that fact that when we look around our own culture, our country, etc., what we see is young people are struggling more and more to recognize the call that God has given them to a particular way of life. Now we have four generic, we're, we can talk about, you know, vocations of the capital V and then, and then just that idea that daily God is calling us to things. But when we think about kind of vocation and the cap, with a capital V, there are four major categories that the church has always talked about, right? We, so we have religious life, being a, a monk or a sister, living in a, 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 a convent or a monastery, something along those lines. So we have religious life. We have priest, the priesthood, typically their diocesan priesthood, although you could be a monk and a priest. So we have religious life, priesthood, marriage, and then we have the consecrated single life, where a person dedicates themselves, usually before their bishop, to a particular mission that they will fil fulfill uh, out in the world while not getting married. So we have these four vocations. And the interesting thing is, is that when you look at all three of the, the three major ones of, among the four, the three most used, um, we see a decline in all of them. So when we, first of all, when we look at religious life, convents and monasteries throughout our country are asking themselves really hard questions along the lines of, can we stay open much longer? We have a lot of convents and monasteries where uh, the age is very top heavy and not a lot of young people are coming forward and so the community is aging and it's uh, those real questions are being asked in lots of different places around our country. Also when we look at priesthood in our own diocese here in Indianapolis we have 17 seminarians and even if all 17 of them get ordained over the next five years we'll have a net loss of 20 priests in our archdiocese. We don't have 20 spots to lose. The thought here might be, okay, so no one's becoming nuns and monks and brothers and, and we're having less people become diocesan priests, so that means everyone's getting married? No. We're also seeing a decline in people getting married and entering into that commitment as well. So they're all declining. And so because of that, I think the church is saying, this is, this is an emergency. We need to sound the alarm and we need to gather and we need to reflect on this and talk about what we're going to do about it. One of the other kind of general observations that I loved talked about this idea and, and maybe begins to, to put one reason to why that might be. And this is something that I've seen and you've probably seen and experienced in your own life over the last five to ten years, a change 
in young adults. And it said, the document says this, young people today refuse to follow a particular vocation if it means giving up taking different paths in the future. Today I choose this, tomorrow we'll see. And I thought that was very, I've noticed that over the last decade or so, a change in that regard, where people seem to be wanting more and more to keep all options open. I'll follow something, but I still want to be able to turn and change my mind and go back or do something different. And, you know, I, I see it with young people. It's like, you know, you, you invite people to, to something, right? And they're like, yeah, I'll come unless I get a better offer. I'll go to dinner with you unless someone cooler calls. It's essentially, I mean, they don't tell you that, right? But it's like, yeah, yeah, I'll be there, sure. Um, unless I change my mind. Um, that lack of commitment. Now, it's really fascinating when we think about that. And I think that is the main reason, perhaps, I believe, personally, that that's probably one of the main reasons that we see a decline in all the vocations. People choosing to just remain in this state throughout most of their adult life where they're not committed to anything in particular. And one of the fascinating things to think about that I was thinking back to my brother who got ordained this summer. And he got ordained a priest. And if you've ever been to an ordination of a priest, it's beautiful uh, ceremony, beautiful mass. And at one part, right before they actually get ordained, they all lay on the floor of the cathedral face first, nose on the stone. And that is symbolic of them dying to their own desires, dying to all their plans or whatever it might be, dying to themselves. And the litany of the saints is being chanted throughout the cathedral and everyone is kneeling and praying for them. And there's not a dry eye in the cathedral at that point. But the reason there's not a dry eye in the cathedral is because not only is that person saying, I choose this, I choose the priesthood, right? He's also saying in that act, I choose for the rest of my life to say no to all this. It's good. All these things are good over here, but I'm saying no to them so that I can do this. And I'm saying no to all these other things over here that I, I don't even know are going to come my way over the next 50 or 60 years of priestly ministry, but I'm already, I'm ready right now to say no to them so that I may do this, right? If what was happening was my brother was making a six-month commitment, no one would have been there. No one would have cared. I, I mean, mom and dad, right? Hey, Tony's making a six-month pledge to do something crazy. You know, maybe the family shows up. But no one else would have cared. The beauty of it was the fact that he's making and giving his entire life and saying no to all these other things so that he may say yes to this. In the same way with the sacrament of marriage. Right? When, a, when a, a, a man and a woman stand here in front of this altar or anywhere else and, and, and enter into the marriage in the church, that's why everyone is, is there. That's why there are tears in everyone's eyes. When I take you to be my wife, good times and in bad, forever, that's the whole point. If it was, I'm going to do this for three months with you and then we'll come back and we'll evaluate, no one would come. No one would care. No one would cry. Right? That's what makes it powerful. I'm not only saying yes to you, I'm saying no to the three billion other women on the planet and all the other women that will come along my way after we get married, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, 40, whatever. I say yes to you. That's the whole point. If you want to remain in that state of always having all of your options open, you will die miserable. You will die miserable. A final consideration, a general observation about this whole issue of doing what St. Paul invites us to do, consider the call you have received, is to ask ourselves, I think we must always remind ourselves, why does God invite us to something? Why? Why is it 
that God gives us a vocation in the first place, both the capital V vocation and then that daily vocation, a daily call. Why is God calling us to things? It's super important that we remind ourselves of that. Because I think we have to remind ourselves, God is perfectly happy within God's self. Perfectly happy. We must start there. And then what happens then after that, if we think God's asking us to do something for him because he needs us to, we will get it all wrong. God is perfectly happy within God's self. So anything that God asks of us is for who? Us. God is giving us a vocation. God called me to the diocesan priesthood for my own sake. He called my brother Aaron and my brother Matt and my brother Danny to marriage for their sake, not for God's. God didn't need someone to marry Carrie or Jenny or anyone else, Jacqueline. He called my brothers to that for their sake. He called me and my brother Tony to the priesthood for our sake. And if we don't get that right, if we think God's asking us to do something, then we're going to reject it. And so we have to remind ourselves why it is that God is calling us in the first place, or else we won't get it right. With regards to religious sisters and brothers, a lot of times people think, like, that's miserable, you know, that's terrible, what a boring way of life. If you went on Seek and you saw any religious sister, they can't stop smiling, okay? It's like they don't even have, they don't have the ability to turn off their smiles. Um, we were on World Youth Day and I ran into one of uh, my students who's a sister for life now out of New York and they were running the, uh, they had about 40 of them there at World Youth Day. They were all just like, they were, they were just giggling all the time. Like, it was just awesome to see. And I, I've never seen uh, so much joy in life as I have among religious sisters. And, and also the same thing um, among, um, been around a lot of religious orders of men, too. Just a great deep joy um, in, in that. Priesthood, really quickly. 93% of priests report being satisfied and loving their job and would do it again, which is by far the highest satisfaction rate of any career. That was a study that was done, I think, by the University of Chicago, or it was in Newsweek. I remember my rector mentioned that in the seminary one time in a talk, and I've, been, I've just been shocked by that. The interesting thing about that is, is that 71% of priests think all, most other priests are not happy, <laughs> which means like, you know, like maybe we're giving off the wrong vibe or something, you know, um, because our brothers think we're miserable, but we're all happy. Like, it's just this crazy thing. And then also, really quickly about marriage, those who live marriage according to the, the plans of the church, with the natural family planning, you know, not using contraception, but instead following the church's vision for marriage, less than 1% divorce. Less than 1%, right? The larger societal divorce rate we know is infinitely higher than that. And so when we see all these plans, we think God might be calling us to something miserable or boring, whether it's marriage, priesthood, or religious life, when in reality, we won't find anything more enjoyable, more joy-filled uh, than when we follow the, the plan that God is giving to us. Now, how do we go about this? How do we go about hearing the call, discerning the call, understanding this call? First of all, there are three steps. I hope that you can maybe remember these as you go forth from here. Ask God, listen to God, and then respond to God. Now, first of all, ask God. Now, that sounds pretty simple, right? Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? What are you calling me to today? Even though I've already become a priest, I still do that. We all still do that. Even though someone gets married, they still ask God that. No matter how old one is, we should continually be asking that. Lord, what do you want me to do today? And it sounds really simple. Of course, duh, everyone starts there. We have to ask God. I didn't do it for 19 years. I did not do that. I had my whole life planned out. That's my mathematical curse that I had. I had it all down to the minute. You know, I was going to do this, I mean, engineering, Purdue, children, marriage, all that kind of stuff. And the first time I asked God, he rocked my world. He said, I see all of your plans. Those are great, but I have completely new ones for you. And it brought me here, and it's awesome. It's great. But I would have never planned this, right? So we have to ask God, first of all, what it is that you want me to do with my life. 
A second thing that we have to do is then we have to listen to God give us the answer. And that's really hard too. Because sometimes what happens is we're like, Lord, what do you want me to do with my life? Oh, didn't hear anything. See ya. We have to listen, and the only way that we can listen, God chooses to come to us the vast majority of the time only in silence. We have to be people who are engaging in silence every day, at least five minutes, ten minutes, somewhere in there, just being completely silent. Not doing anything, not checking anything on my phone, not journaling, not reading anything, not doing anything other than being still. And being okay with not hearing anything, but knowing that eventually God will speak to us and come to us in silence. It's a beautiful passage in the Old Testament where one of the prophets is in a cave and he says, Lord, show me yourself. And there's fire and there's wind and there's storms and God's not any of that. And then it says there was a still small whisper and the prophet hid his face because he knew it was God. So we have to ask God, then we have to listen and wait for the response whether that's our daily call or our overall life plan, we have to ask and then we have to listen. The final thing is to respond with courage. We might ask and we might listen to God's response, but then we have to respond with courage. What I mean by that is I know people who've asked God, who've listened to the answer, and then have said, I don't have what it takes to do that. In every parish that I've been in so far, I've been with young men because they, they, they come with questions you know, about the priesthood. I know people at every parish that I've been to so far as a priest that have had very profound calls to the diocesan priesthood. I'm just using this as an example. Very profound calls to the diocesan priesthood. They, you know, they asked God, God told them, here it is. They might have even had you know, some very powerful spiritual visions and, 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 and so on and so forth. And their response has been, no, I can't. I can't do that. For whatever reason, fill in the blank. Whatever it is, you called me to that, Lord. However, I can't. And I think one of the reasons, one of the main things that keeps us from responding to the call with courage is precisely what St. Paul is saying in the second reading. He says, brothers and sisters, consider the call you have received. And then he goes on to this whole point, which sounds like, at first it sounds like offensive. He's basically saying, you don't have hardly any natural gifts. You're not good at anything. That's essentially what St. Paul is saying, right? In that very blunt St. Paul way. But he's saying, he's reminding them, look, God carries us. God gives you what you need to do the things that God calls you to. That's exactly what St. Paul is saying. He says, you, did, you didn't have these talents. God gave them to you. You, you were weak. We we're all weak. But God will sustain us in the call that he continues to give to us. Whether that's being a priest or being a religious, or being married, but also within that, the daily calls, God will sustain us in that too. I want you, God might be telling you today, I want you to go speak to Bethany, or Kurt. And we're like, no, I can't. And God's like, yes, you can. I will sustain you. I want you to be a priest. I can't. Yes, you can. I will sustain you in that. Right? If you think about the converse of that, the idea is laughable, right? We go to God. God, what do you want me to do with my life? I want you to be a priest. And then the person says, okay. And then God's like, ha, I tricked you. And I'm not giving you anything to help you do that. I'm going to totally abandon you. Does God do that? Ha, I called you to marriage and you, you, you believe me. But now I'm not going to sustain you at all. I'm not going to give you anything to get through it. I just wanted to see if you do it. Right? Like, that's the devil. Like, that's not God. God loves us. So God's going to sustain us. To those men who were like, God called them to be the priest, and they're like, no? Like, what did you think God was going to do? Abandon you? I know God gives us the, th the things that we need to live out our ministry because I look back at my life 
And I realize that all the things that I am sustained in as a priest are not coming from me. They're not my own natural things that I had. They were given to me by God in order to help me in this ministry. And so we have to be people who ask God. We have to be people who listen to the response. And then we have to be people who respond with courage to the call once we hear it. And then we have to be people who are asking daily, what are you calling me to in my life? But also, what are you calling me to this moment, in this place? We pray that the prayers that we offer today at this Mass, that the sacraments that we receive, the support of others, may all continue to strengthen us to ask, to listen, and then to respond to the call that God gives us.